Thank you very much, uh, Wendy, for this kind invite, first of all. And thank you to everyone else who's gone before me. One of the great things about going last in these things is that people say almost everything you wanted to say. Um, so I've just been, I've restructured what I wanted to go through about six times now. Um, and I decided in the end that I'd start by sharing with you that just now at about 5.05 p.m., uh, Roger saw me do this, right? I was gobbling down two dates and a few um, snacker balls uh, because it's Ramadan for me at the moment. And so I haven't been eating or drinking since about 5 a.m. And, and I thought I would, I, I would that, that sunset was 5.05, right? So I, I, I did that. And um, I wanted to share a little bit about Ramadan because I think actually that there are interesting applications and, and principles that come from the concepts of fasting that actually apply when we think about how we do cultural shifts uh, in relation to large complex problems like climate change. It's wonderful to do Ramadan in, in Wellington, by the way, because where I come from in Singapore, we fast from about 5 till 7 p.m. Uh, so being in the Southern Hemisphere anywhere during this time of year is a good thing. Um, and I always tell people, you know, the hard bit about Ramadan is not the staying away from food or drink. It's the think good thoughts and don't think bad thoughts part of the, the injunctions, because that's always difficult. People brush against you on the road, you know, you meet your boss and you just think, oh, that's gone, right? Today's fast is now nullified because I've had all these terrible, terrible thoughts. <laughs> but I wanted to talk about fasting because I think increasingly, you know, traditions like fasting, I don't just mean the, the Islamic practice of fasting, but traditions like Lent or traditions of denial that we find in, in Buddhism and, and Hinduism and other great wisdom traditions are exactly the ways to shift levels of consciousness that um, Corin, you talked about. You know? and, and I think they, they help us to realize that we're not just base beings. I wanted to share four ways in which I find that each year Ramadan helps me shift my consciousness. Invariably, I lapse again after that, but that's why we do it once a year, you know, because there's a renewal after that. And one of the first shifts is that it moves me from a mode of isolation to realizing my complex interdependence with others. And that will be with my family, with whom I wake up in the morning to, to eat. So that makes fasting alone always difficult. But it includes trying to help and feed others in their fast right, and, and assist them if they don't have the wherewithal. And it reminds me that I'm part of a much more complex web than any individual or atomized view of the world might suggest. And I think this is exactly what Claudia was talking about when she talked about cross-party linkages. Right? This is about moving beyond isolation to interdependence. I feel like Chloe talked about this when she talked about social responsibility as well. And Roger, when he said, we need a paradigm to realize that climate change affects me, not just some abstract individual out there. Those are the ways in which we think about moving beyond this isolation and realizing that, that there's a culture of interdependence at work here. The, the second big shift that I find Ramadan always precipitates for me is that I move from a purely analytical mode, right, just trying to understand problems, to realizing that I actually have agency in problems. And this means, for instance, that I could look at the day and think, oh my god, how do I deal with not having food for the whole day, right? But then I also realized that actually there are small steps I can take which help that. It helps, for instance, to not drink diuretic things in the morning so that I don't lose water. It helps to have simple, well not simple, it helps to have complex proteins and it helps to have low glycemic index foods because those don't get digested very fast. So if you have lots of cereal, you will be hungry at 11 a.m. But if you have a couple of eggs and some guacamole or some hummus, simple plant-based foods, right? No, I'm not even talking about carb uh, large animal proteins. That changes the nature of a fast. You're not hungry until about 4, maybe even 4.30. And I mention this because I think that agency is important. When we realize that we are not just analytical beings, right? that we're not powerless in this process, but we have agency and choice, that, I think, is how we realize that individuals can change things, right? to use the, the language that, that Claudia used in, in her remarks. And I think realizing that we have that power, even if it's just a tiny bit of power to affect a tiny bit of the whole equation, that is a really key part of the transformation that we need to make if we are to make any kind of meaningful attempt to address climate change. The third thing that I think 
uh, Ramadan does for me is it moves me from what I like to call a pure exchange mindset to a mindset of gifts. And what I mean by that is, I think we live in an economy where we measure almost everything by the exchange value that it can have. What is the worth of something? What is its value? What is its monetary quantifiable worth? But that's not why people fast or deny themselves. Right? They do it because there is some larger power asking them to do this. That's what faith fundamentally is. And I realize each year with Ramadan that when I do these actions, it's not because of some rational process, although it's great as a proxy diet. Um, but it's about the space to try new things, right? It's about giving something that is much bigger than yourself and realizing that you are part of a whole in which when you give something, you don't do it because you expect anything in return. You do it simply because giving is the right thing to do. And that sort of giving has a momentum to it. It carries forward to other people because there is nothing that we expect in recompense. And I think this is exactly the kind of t uh, the difference between the types of capital that, that Connell, you talked about. You know, this is not a world of quantifiable economic capital. It's a world where the natural capital that we are faced with has deep value, and that social and human capital also transcend the easy quantifiable metrics of our lives. And when we can move beyond a pure exchange mindset to realizing that the climate and the world we're in is a gift, and we can make gifts to it in return, then I think we restore some balance to this highly imbalanced world and ecosystem that we live in. Which brings me to the last big consciousness shift that Ramadan always um, and, uh, kind of elucidates and, and elicits for me. And that's moving from a perfectionist mindset to a good enough mindset. Ramadan can be very daunting when you think about the fact that it's 30 days long. Right? When, you, when the start of it comes along, I always ask, tell myself, oh my god, 30 days is a long time to go without food and drink and bad thoughts from sunrise to sunset. But when you think about it again, you realize that actually, if you take it a minute at a time, or an hour at a time, or you tell yourself, I'll just do this one task, and then I'll rest for five minutes, and then I'll try something else, and then I'll do something else, and you take it a step at a time, then that, that perfectionist mindset goes away, and we realize that we have a good enough mindset, a mindset that says every step we take is enough because it gets us a little bit further along the way. And I think of that when it comes to climate change as well, because if we try to change the whole system and boil the ocean all at once, that's a terrible metaphor, isn't it? Boil the ocean when it comes to climate change. <laughs> but you know what I mean. If we try and do everything all at once, that's not going to help us at all. But if we take small steps, then I think we do get a little bit closer to the kinds of aims that we are trying to achieve. And all of this kind of brings me back since I started by talking about Ramadan, let me end with a spiritual observation as well. One of the great observations from the Jewish ethics of the fathers is from a chap called Rabbi Tarfon, who says, do not uh, desist from trying to make the world better. Right? Don't ch try, stop trying to change the world. Because he says, it is not for you to complete the task, but neither are you at liberty to desist from it. Now, that's very powerful when you think about it. Don't desist. Right? It is not for you to, to complete the task, but neither are you at liberty to desist from it. This leads me to the three hows that I'll end with in, in about 30 seconds. Because if we are to not desist and keep trying to change things, then I think we need to do three things. One, periodically we need to minimize and slow down the way that the great wisdom traditions of fasting and denial suggest to us. Second, we need to always start with small and slow and imperfect steps if necessary but we need to start nonetheless. And we need to do whatever we can, whenever we can. And I suspect if we are living by those three principles, we'll get a lot further than we have so far. Thank you.